my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Pauline Barrieux, uh, who is our David Sprott Distinguished Speaker today. She's a professor and head of the Department of Statistics at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Um, Professor Barrier's pedigree is pretty impressive. She obtained a, in 2002 a PhD in finance from the Hautes Etudes Commerciales in France under the supervision of Marc Chenet and also obtained a PhD in applied mathematics in 2002 from uh, the Laboratoire de Probabilité et Modèle Aléatoire from the uh, Université Paris 6 under the supervision of uh, Professor Nicole Cavoui. She actually won the prize for the best uh, actuarial PhD dissertation in 2003. And uh, she's also a qualified actuary from the uh, French Institute of Actuaries. Professor Barrieux is an associate editor for many journals, uh, including the IME, Bernoulli, and the Science Journal of uh, Financial Mathematics. And uh, she won a number of Best Research Paper Award, including a Best Research Paper in Quantitative Finance from the Europlace Institute of Finance for the paper in Convolution of Risk Measures and Optimal Risk Transfer, uh, co-authored with Nicole Kawi and published in Finance and Stochastics in 2005. She also won a Best Research Paper for, uh, in Finance and Sustainable Development from the European Union's Responsible Investment Forum for the paper on precautionary policies with co-author uh, Bernard Sinclair Gagné, <coughs> which was published in Management Science in 2006. So as you can see, our work covers uh, many topics, um, including model uncertainty, insurance-linked securitization, contract designing, micro-insurance, weather derivatives, and environmental economics. So today we'll have the chance to hear uh, or speak to us about uh, assessing financial model risk. Welcome to Waterloo and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, introduction and also thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, here with you in Waterloo. It's my first time at University of Waterloo. Um, I feel also extremely privileged to uh, have been asked to give this uh, distinguished lecture, so um, thank you for giving me this opportunity. So when um, thinking about what uh, to choose as a topic for this lecture, um, I, I spent quite some time and I decided on um, presenting some relatively recent works uh, I did on model uncertainty. Relatively recent uh, because uh, I've been burdened with some administrative duties that are preventing me from being an extremely active researcher. So these works are relatively recent in this aspect. They are based on various collaborations uh, with two uh, colleagues and friends of mine. So the first is Bernard Sinclair Desgagné from, um, from Canada. He's, uh, he works at HEC Montréal, so not very far away from here. And uh, the second uh, co-author is uh, Giacomo Scandolo from uh, University of Florence in Italy. So just as a, a sort of general background, in many different situations, you will have different models, different scenarios, different experts giving different opinions. And this is typically referred to as model uncertainty. And in such a setting, in such a framework, you will have different questions. And the typical questions could be, how do you assess the model uncertainty? How do you assess the confidence you have uh, in a given model or in a given class of model in order to make your decision, if you have a decision to make. How do you take a decision in this setting? And finally, what is the impact of model uncertainty on, on the decision itself? So why does this happen? Why do model disagrees? Why do expert disagree? So there might be many different reasons. You might have competing theories. It's especially true in economics, in growth theory, monetary policies, macroeconomics. 
can be also uh, in environmental with ecosystem resilience. It might be due to insufficient data, and this is typically mentioned for global warming or climate-related situations. But it can be also uh, due to undetermined empirical specifications. You might have problems of measurement and empirical proxies. For instance, in medicine, this might be uh, the case. You might have problem of nonlinearities. So there might be different reasons why these situations happen, and it might be difficult to actually eliminate uh, this type of situation. So what is the impact on the policy uh, choice or on decision making? So policy, this is usually referred when you look at a public decision, or decision which in, it is an individual decision making, based on a particular model, might underestimate the uncertainty surrounding on you know, what would be the impact of the decision or the policy choice. So the model risk will refer typically of the potential bad consequences of choosing the wrong model for a given purpose. So when you say wrong model, it means that somehow, somewhere, there should be the right model. So this is a question in itself. So do you have a better model or do you have a right model somewhere? This is a whole, uh, a whole problem and a whole question. Narrowing a little bit our scope and focusing on financial model risks. So uh, we need to understand what is a model in a financial context. So I, I looked at the Federal Reserve Board and they have the following definition of a model in the financial context. So a model is a quantitative method, system, or approach that applies statistical, economic, financial, or mathematical theories, techniques, and assumptions to process input data into quantitative estimates. So this is a very, very broad definition. And what is interesting is that inputs can be quantitative, but they can be also qualitative. So you might have qualitative expert opinion or qualitative feedback as input uh, into a, a model. So financial model risk, so if we look at what we said earlier and which um, translated into financial terms, so this is the potential of having bad consequences uh, for, from decision based on the wrong uh, or not well suited model. So this could lead to financial losses, to poor investment strategy, and, and so on. Earlier I mentioned as a possible reason for model uncertainty the lack of data and climate change. But there might be also an interesting question, what happens when you have too much data? And in particular with all this question around big data uh, that are very topical, is there an impact of having uh, big data on model risks? So what is the, uh, the impact of having an inflation on the, of data on the model risk itself and model uncertainty? That's an open question. Okay, so narrowing still, so from the um, financial setting, I'm interested now in capital requirements. So we are becoming more and more focused. So what is capital requirement? I'm sure you all know this, but just to make sure that we are on the same ground. This is the amount of capital, so a financial institution, for, for example, a bank or an insurance company, has to hold as reserve in order to protect the capital. And it's required by the financial regulator. So this is to make sure that the bank does not become insolvent or um, does not take on excess leverage. So there are some rules on how to calculate the capital requirements that have been developed over the years by the Basel Committee. So just a little bit of history on this. The Basel Accord, so Basel from the uh, Swiss uh, city, set a framework on how banks and financial institutions must calculate their capital. So the first attempt was really in 1988 with Basel I, where you had a capital measurement system. Then it became a little bit more complex with a capital adequacy framework in 2004, which is referred to as Basel II. And then following the crisis, um, a financial crisis of 2007 and 8. It was replaced by Basel III, which is uh, gradually put in place between 2013 and 19, with even the introduction of Basel IV uh, last year, uh, more on the uh, operational risk. So Basel III, which is a current uh, setting, is supposed to really strengthen the capital requirements of the bank by increasing the liquidity and decreasing the, the leverage. So in order to do this, you need some financial risk measures in order to compute the capital requirement. So um, 
The most famous one is called the value at risk, and that's the one that was introduced by Basel II. And you all know this, but this is defined as the smallest amount of capital you need to put aside to protect the value of your portfolio, let's denote it by X, over a period of time at a certain level, alpha, and alpha is typically very small. So in terms of equation, the value at risk, uh, level alpha of X, is the smallest amount M. So that's when you add M to the value of your portfolio X, the probability of making a loss is very small. Or equivalently, the probability that X falls below uh, the vast threshold or minus the vast threshold is smaller than alpha. There is another uh, risk measure that is quite uh, popular, especially in the insurance context. This is the expected shortfall. And it's uh, defined as the expected value of the loss of the portfolio given that you are below the vast threshold. So it's a conditional expectation of X given that X is below the, the VAR. So academically, there has been a huge literature on financial risk measure with uh, uh, some fundamental reflection on what should be the key properties, what sh should be the requirements of uh, appropriate risk measure and for which purposes and so on. And um, you have some of uh, the experts working with you uh, at, uh, in your department. So um, I'm not going to, to detail this here. That's not the purpose. So the agenda of the rest of the talk is as follows. So, I would like to focus first on model risk and risk management. Then I will spend a bit of time talking about one thing which is called the Basel multiplier and seeing what it is. And then I will introduce uh, three possible measures of model risk um, looking at different purposes. One that is, we call absolute measure, another one that we call relative measure, and a third one that we call local measure. Then I will uh, mention further problems and some practical investigations. And then I would like to uh, finish by making some remarks on policy making under modern uncertainty. So, <coughs> model risk and uh, risk management. So for financial institutions, it's more and more critical to deal with this question of model risk and to have some ways of quantifying it with the implementation of new regulatory frameworks. With um, this new framework make it possible for a financial institution um, to use internal models instead of standard methods. And to be able to use internal models, you need to look at uh, the model risk related to it. There is a distinction that I would like to make um, here for the rest of the talk between what I will call model risk and estimation risk. By model risk, I really mean the risk of misspecifying the model, which I'm dissociating from the risk of calibrating badly or uh, looking at wrong estimate of the parameters of the model. So I'm making really this clear distinction between the two. <coughs> Sorry. To, to consider the model risk as a separate risk factor for the financial institution, it's necessary to have some forms of quantifications. There has been uh, quite a few attempts in the, in the literature to propose, uh, especially an abstract coverage, but the focus is mainly on pricing and hedging. And you have really two, two big trends to simplify things, <coughs> model averaging or worst case in very broad terms. So from a practical point of view, there is no compulsory capital charges for induced model risk, but there is a suggestion of a multiplication factor, the Basel multiplier, and I will come back to it in the next slide. This multiplier, as you will see, uh, can be interpreted as giving a relationship between the risk measure under different possible distributions that you have for the underlying risk, and therefore this is close to the worst case in that aspect. So the objective here is to propose ways to quantify model risk when you want to measure financial risk, but in a regulatory framework. <coughs> and we will introduce different quantitative measures for different purposes, sorry. The hay fever in London is gone, but because you are a bit delayed here for the 
<laughs> the hay fever is starting. Sorry. Okay, so this basal multiplier I've been mentioning, what is it? So as I said earlier, you, um, now the regulatory framework authorizes a financial institution to use internal models to assess the capital requirement due to market risk instead of standard methods. The leading term that measures the market risk is given by this formula, uh, CC, so CC for capital charge, which is a maximum between two terms. The first one is the value at risk of the portfolio or the 1% 10 days horizon. So that's just this. The second term is slightly more complicated. It's a coefficient lambda, that is the multiplier, times an average of value at risk, but the average of the 60 last value at risk. The multiplier lambda is assigned to each institution by the regulator and is in the interval between three and four. <clears throat> it depends on uh, backtesting performances of the system. So if you perform badly, then lambda is bigger, and it is revised on periodical basis. Since uh, lambda is between three and four, you see that if you are in sort of normal uh, situation, so not on crisis today, uh, Lambda times the average of the value at risk should be the leading term in, in this maximum. So the fact that it's between three and four uh, is an interesting fact. And um, now some time ago, Stahl in 97 uh, looked at why is this lambda has to be between three and four. So it's just a short justification that I'm, uh, I'm looking at what Stahl did and uh, taking you through the argument. So if X now represents the profit and loss of the portfolio due to market risk, since the time horizon you are considering is very short, you can assume that it's centered. And um, just a little remark on the impact of the variance. Um, the value at risk alpha of x is sigma the value at risk alpha of x tilde, x tilde being the normalized version of x. I'm making this remark here to show you that, the, to illustrate the remark I made earlier about the difference between model misspecification and the estimation risk. Here I'm interested in the question of choosing the distribution, the type of distribution of x, not on finding what sigma should be. Okay, so this is really about the modern specification. So from Chebyshev inequality, we can obtain an upper bound for the var that is given uh, below. And what Stahl did is to compare this bound, this upper bound, with a var that you would obtain making the assumption that x is normally distributed. And he plugged in the two var. So in black, you have the, the value at risk for the normal distribution, the x-axis is the level alpha, and the upper bound is, um, is the red curve. We assume sigma is equal to one. <coughs> and then he plug the ratio. So the upper bound that I have under uh, divided by uh, the value at risk under the normal assumption. And you have this curve, the x-axis is alpha, and you see that for typical values of alpha between, let's say, 1% and 5%, the ratio is roughly between three and four. So if you m multiply the value at risk computed under normal assumption by lambda, you have an upper bound for the worst possible var. So this is what this multiplier is making, is basically linking what you do with your distribution, your distribution choice with the worst case, okay? A question would be, can we do the same with the expected shortfall? The answer is yes, so again, same. So X is a, a profit and loss, we assume it's centered. We can uh, use again the Chebyshev inequality and we can look at what happens under the normal assumption. We can plug it the two expected shortfall, the upper bound in red and uh, under normal assumption in black. We do the ratio upper bound divided by what happens when uh, your reference distribution is normal. And for typical values of alpha, so alpha is the x-axis, this ratio is roughly between four and eight. So if we were to use uh, the same idea of basal multiplier by using expected shortfall as a reference risk measure, 
the uh, lambda should be uh, between four and eight and not three and four for the same reason. Few points here. So you see that this lambda depends highly on the choice of the upper bound. And the choice of the upper bound is obtained by using the Chebyshev upper bounds. The, um, they are questionable because they are not sharp. Okay, so we can do better than that. Um, it's very important to, to, if you want to work in that direction, that you use proper sharp bounds and not any bound, because this will have a huge impact on your estimation of, uh, of the model risk. And choosing uh, any other bound might lead to have uh, an inaccurate assessment of the model risk. So for instance, for the value at risk, a sharp bound can be obtained using Cantelli's inequality. Okay, so this will be. This, does not, this is not the case for the expected shortfall. We need to work a little bit more, but this was the, the idea. So what is our objective here is uh, to look at this notion of multiplier, to, to, to go in that direction, considering ratios between worst case risk and the risk computed when you choose a particular reference model by looking at sharp bounds. So to do so, we need to consider three things. So a risk measure, a reference model, and a class of alternative models. So a class of alternative models might be anything you want. It could be, include parametric or non-parametric families of distribution or small perturbation. But that's the three things you need, risk measure, reference model, and set of alternative models. OK, I'll go quickly on this. So the risk measure um, is, uh, I will denote it by rho, will be a map defined on some uh, set of random variables satisfying three key properties in our case. Low invariant, so it means that if X and Y have the same distribution, then they will have the same risk measures. Positive homogeneous, so if you inflate uh, your position by a coefficient, by a positive coefficient A, you will inflate the risk measure by the same coefficient. And translation invariant, so if you add uh, an amount of cash to your, the value of your portfolio, the amount you need to put aside in order to, pro to protect your portfolio is simply uh, the same amount, but reduced by the amount of cash you, you added to your portfolio. So both the value at risk and the expected shortfall satisfy these properties, but of course there are many other risk measures satisfying these properties. So we have the risk measure. Now in terms of the distributions we are working with. So let uh, x0 will be our reference random variable. And we assume that it's positively charged, so it actually has some risk. By low invariance, what we really are interested in is the distribution of x0. And we define by uh, L, we denote by L, the set of all possible uh, alternative random variables we want to consider. So x0 belongs to L, but... Um, there are other models inside. We define two uh, different quantities, so rho lower bar, which is the infimum of all risk measures on L, and rho upper bar, so the supremum, so the worst case if you want. And we assume that both are finite. So our objective is really to look at a quantitative measure of a model risk when you pick the particular model, the particular reference model X0 within the class L, and when you work with the risk measure rho. So I mentioned earlier that we will introduce three different ways of assessing model risk in this particular setting. And the first one is what I refer to as absolute measure of model risk. So I denote it by AM for absolute measure. It depends on rho x0 and L. And we define it as a ratio of the worst case, so rho upper bar, which was a supremum of all uh, risk measure, divided by rho x0, which is a risk measure associated with your particular choice of model, minus 1. So it's greater or equal to 0. Um, it's equal to 0 if and only if you choose the worst case and uh, the worst case distribution. So you can see that uh, in our logic of linking it with the multiplier that we had earlier, if you do AM plus one, basically AM plus one can be interpreted as a general multiplier. Because if you multiply rho x zero by AM plus one, you obtain the worst case. And if L represents all the possible mo alternative models from your reference model x zero, AM quantify really how bad the worst case is. 
And this is an absolute measure in the sense that if you increase your set of alternative models, you increase AM. Okay. So it has some interesting properties. I don't want to go into details, but there is scale invariance and some translation sensitivities. They are useful for the following example. So the purpose of the example is just to illustrate that it's possible to uh, do something with this particular measure. So, so it's just an example. So X, let's assume that we are interested in all models having the same mean and the same variance. Okay, so we don't know which model, but we just say, oh, I'm sure of the mean mu and I'm sure of the variance sigma square. So L mu sigma, it represents a set of all models or all random variables having the same mean and the same variance. As before, because we focus on the short time horizon, we can assume that mu is equal to zero. We are looking at profit and loss. And by scale invariance, that's uh, one of the property of AM, we will concentrate uh, on the case L01, which means mean zero and variance one, okay? So if X0 belongs to this set, so it's one distribution, one random variable with mean zero and variance one, AM can be defined uh, as rho upper bar, so the, the worst case of a Z set, divided by rho X0 minus one. So what we need to obtain, so let me do this, is we need to have to understand what this is for the var and the expected shortfall in our framework, okay? So we, are, we already know the sharp uh, bound for the value at risk and uh, using Cantelin equality, we have um, the, the soup over L01. We can use convex programming techniques and in particular paper by Berzinas and others to have the same for the expected shortfall uh, to obtain the, the soup of the expected shortfall over L01. Uh, and therefore we have an explicit formula in this particular case for the value at risk and the expected shortfall. So now let's assume, so here is just a little illustration. So in the x-axis, again, this is alpha. And here what I plug is the absolute measure on L01, assuming that my reference model is a normal, okay? So I'm working still on this set of models with same mean zero, same variance one, but let's assume that the, mod the model I pick is a normal one, okay? So what is my absolute measure? So here in black, you have for the value at risk, if your risk measure is a value at risk, and it's red for the expected shortfall. You remember that it's equal to zero when you pick the worst case, so basically when you have no model risk, and it increases um, when you deviate from the worst case, when your model risk increases. So when alpha tends to zero, the model risk increases, okay, which is somehow logical because you really, really go far uh, in the tail. For student T, you can do also the same, so it's exactly the same idea. So you work again with same class of distribution, same mean, same variance, but now what happens if the reference model I pick is a student T distribution? And you can find again the same. The same type, uh, another type of measure of model risk that we can consider is a relative measure of model risk, and I denote it by RM for relative measure. It depends on rho, x0, and L. So this time, it's the ratio between the numerator is the deviation from the worst case, so how far you are when you pick x0 compared to the worst case, and the denominator is the whole possible range of deviation, so rho upper bar is the worst case, rho lower bar is when you uh, take the infimum, okay, of all the risk measures. So what is interesting, I find, personally, with this uh, measure of model risk is you are really focusing on what is the relative position of uh, your particular choice of reference uh, model within the range. So it's between zero and one, so RM will be equal to zero when you, ha you are in the worst case already, so it means no model risk, and it will be equal uh, to one when you have full model risk, in a sense, that's basically when you pick the, the infimum. It does not need to be increasing in L. So if you increase the size of, uh, of your alternative set of models, uh, RM might not increase because you are looking really at the relative position. So the purpose is really to be able to compare different frameworks together in this sense. 
Again, this has some nice properties, but this time scale and translation invariance that will help us to look at a particular case. And I choose exactly the same setting as before, so to focus on the set of possible models with same mean and same variance, okay? So we already know the worst case risk measure, but we now we need to focus on what happened at the infimum. So for the value at risk, um, there are some results in Ehrlichman giving you the, the results, and we can also prove for the expected short for what happens. So we have um, on that case for the for the relative measure for the value at risk and the expected short for we have explicit formula. Again, just to show that we can plug and see what happens. So uh, if you choose x0 being normal within this particular class of model, having the same mean and the same variance, um, that's, that's what happened. It becomes more and more important as alpha uh, tends to zero. And the same for student t uh, distribution. The last type of uh, measure of model risk I would like to, to present is um, slightly different uh, in the sense that you are interested in what happened really locally around x0. So um, locally it might mean different things. But for example, it might mean that there is some distance, you are, you are looking at something within a certain distance in a, uh, between distribution around x0, but it can be also a mixture of distribution uh, also centered around uh, x0. And uh, the way we, we define it is if this exists, we look at the relative measure in a set uh, L epsilon and we let epsilon tends to zero, but that will be the limit of, of these things. And really the idea is to look at the relative position of the, the risk you're taking when you choose x zero, but uh, within um, a sort of surrounding of infinitesimal perturbation around x0. So the purpose is quite, di is quite different because here you are almost sure in a way that x0 is the right one. You just want to see how stable this choice is. So it is quite different from the absolute and the relative measure. So just to show that we can, we can work out things, so very briefly because I don't want to spend too much time on, on equations in this talk, but you can look at epsilon mixture of distribution and basically in that case you need to work, at, to work uh, on the relative measure in, on L epsilon. So you need the soup and you need the inf, for instance for the value at risk. You can find it, this is for two different uh, level of epsilon. In black this is for epsilon 0.2 and in red epsilon 0.05 with alpha on the x-axis, and what you're interested in is letting epsilon tends to zero. So you might do a, a few things, but uh, in particular, if you look at the standard normal as your choice for x zero, which could be a particular choice, you can have a, a, a limit, an explicit limit, and uh, as a function of alpha. So, um, few things. If you wanted to do the same thing for the local uh, measure, but for the expected shortfall is uh, another challenge because you really need uh, to study the extremal distribution with respect to the stop loss stochastic order and then it becomes uh, more complicated. We just worked on some uh, little example to see how far we could go, but it would be really interesting to consider a perturbation set uh, related to distances. But more generally, relatively to this work. Um, I made the point at the beginning to really, really separate misspecification risk, so the, you know, about the choice of the model, and estimation risk, thinking, okay, here we don't have any problem with estimation. Of course, this does not work like this in practice, and it would be nice to look at, you know, the global picture. To have the global picture, you need also multivariate, right? So this is, um, this, this is the whole, looking at the whole package in a way. But uh, for me, uh, the way we did this study was, okay, we pick a distribution, what is the risk we are taking by picking this distribution out of a set of alternative models, how can we quantify this? So this is the idea, you choose your distribution, you have a set of alternative, and then what is, how to assess the model risk. Uh, I think we can think 
of the same thing, but in the reverse order. So let's assume you have a sort of threshold of admissibility on the level of model risk you can take. Can this help you to choose good reference model? So you, you work from different assessment of model risk over different possible reference models. You look at threshold of admissibility according to some criteria maybe imposed by the regulator. And then it helps you to choose what should be the right reference model you have to work with within a particular class. And I think this could be an, uh, an interesting alternative way of uh, looking at this particular measure. Um, SCORE, which is a big reinsurance company, looked um, at the question of uh, absolute measure of model risk, AM, for reserving risk in non-life insurance. So they looked at how practical it was and how sensitive uh, this was and um, whether they could use it in practice, in particular, to choose a, the reference model. So, um, of course, there are, we worked first in a theoretical environment and the class L of alternative models is really nice, but in practice, the choice of class of considered models is obviously very important. It needs to be large enough so that you can do things, but it shouldn't be too large because it should be somehow representative of what you, you want to do. So there is key decision regarding the choice of the reference model within this class. So they use statistical model validation techniques and expert opinion, but of course this is um, also subject to, to discussion. And um, their problem was relative lack of data um, on, their particular, on this particular issue. So what they obtained was that the uh, absolute measure is relatively large. So high model risk, you remember? So zero is when you have no model risk, you are the worst case, and uh, the higher it gets, somehow the more model risk you have, and very sensitive to the choice of the reference model within the class of considered models. So what they, what they did as a, as a possible way to uh, reduce the sensitivity was to use different possible reference models, compute the absolute measure in each of these cases, and then uh, did a sort of weighted average. So basically, uh, and the weight depending, they did, I think, equal weights, but it could be a more um, subtle way of uh, putting weights depending on some back testing or some fits or some uh, confidence level on the uh, expert opinion. So that was the first part of what I wanted to, to present today. Now I move to something slightly different, but still related to model uncertainty, uh, which is the question of policy making under model uncertainty. So, and I've been working with Bernard, I mentioned earlier, Bernard Sinclair Desgagne. I've been working uh, almost since I finished my PhD with him on uh, topics related to decision making under model uncertainty. And uh, we have been trying to find uh, an approach. So that what we really would like to achieve is to find an approach that is practical, so really focusing on the decision making that uh, is not narrowed to a particular application area. So we don't want to say, oh, we are focusing on financial application, or we are focusing on environmental uh, decisions. So it should be somehow broad. And um, what we are interested in is there are many, many methods and approaches uh, presented in the literature. And we would like to find some common features. What do they have in common? Okay, can we have a setting that links them together. So yeah, is there a common framework for the most commonly used approaches? And the most, most commonly used approaches for decision making on a model uncertainty, you can uh, put them in, in various categories. So you have model averaging that I mentioned earlier. You have all the literature on ambiguity aversion. You have robust control techniques, but you might have also voting. We are less familiar with this because it's not so quantitative, but this is also a technique for uh, handling decision, especially for policy making uh, under model uncertainty. So the general framework we look at, I will be quite succinct because I know the time and you all want to go to have 
the drinks and cocktail in the atrium. So uh, I don't want to enter into details of notation. I just want to give you a flavor of uh, the, the way we, we present things. So a model, I denote it by M, will bring together various things. So it's a sort of box where you put different things in it. So you can put some exogenous parameter, uh, to control variables or policies that the one we are interested in, Z, and some endogenous variables. And for each of the parameters and policy, the model will generate something. So it can be a description, scenario, forecast, on what you are trying to look at, on your matter of interest. And this scenario that uh, I will uh, name it scenario for the rest, I denote it by uh, omega. So these scenarios can be anything. So it can be point estimate, it can be probability distribution, it can be stochastic process, it can be also qualitative. Okay, it can be yes. Okay, or it can be maybe, or I don't know. Okay, it can be red, anything. So we will refer to a model as a mapping, so taking you from the set of policies onto the set of scenarios with the understanding that omega, so your, your little scenario, is m of z. So we assume that they have, you have n different models, m1 to mn, to inform the policy makers. And when you look at all generated scenarios, it belongs to omega bar. And so you have the model uncertainty because you have the coexistence of these n different models. So rational policy making, so we still assume some form of rationality, consists in uh, looking for a particular policy Z star that we solved a problem, the optimization problem that is on the screen, and it's quite general. So what you want to find is the optimal policy Z, Z is your policy, maximizing a function V that depends on M1Z, which is the outcome of model one given the policy Z, M to Z, okay? And this can be, you remember, this can be qualitative, but this can be scenarios, uh, this can be point estimates, this can be distribution function, anything, okay? Subject to a constraint of admissibility. And the constraint of admissibility is you have this function S, I'm going to explain what it is in a second, combining the the different model outcomes, M1Z to MNZ, greater than D, which is your admissibility threshold. So V, the function you want to maximize, represent preferences in a very broad term of a vector of scenarios. The mapping, S, now we're looking at the constraint, S represents some scores. So this is a way to evaluate what the, the different models outcomes are, or, uh, implied by a particular policy Z, and D will be the threshold on the score. What is interesting is, um, at least I find it really interesting, is that the score function, this uh, S function, you, you does not have necessarily a dimension um, that is equal to the number of models. So you can group the models differently, okay? So it can be any dimension between one and n. So you can um, work with subgroup of models if they are, belong to a certain, certain uh, similar class, if you want. And we assume that this problem has a solution. And this problem, if it has a solution, it has also a dual. And the dual is you look for the function pi minimizing pi of d, d being your admissibility threshold, subject to a constraint that is the when you apply pi to the score, this is greater than v of the model for all possible z prime, and pi is non-increasing. So this function pi can be interpreting, interpreted sorry, as a pricing function, and so basically what this dual problem does is really you are pricing your admissibility threshold subject to a constraint. And this constraint is an interesting one because at the optimum for pi, what you are saying is that pi of s is greater than v with all the arguments inside. And pi, of, pi um, this particular term, pi, this is a willingness to accept in economics, 
which is greater than the willingness to pay. And what you have is, in terms of weak duality, is that the willingness to accept is always greater than the willingness to pay, which makes a lot of sense in terms of in economic terms. So we have this sort of general setting that I mentioned here. For different, we don't specify what V should look like, okay, or what the various things. And what we look at is whether the standard approaches fit into this setting. And all the standard approaches that I mentioned earlier, model averaging, ambiguity aversion, uh, robust control, and voting, they can be seen as a particular case of this general setting. Okay? So we were really excited by this. <laughs> and um, what is interesting is we were able to uh, derive some general properties of optimal policies. In this setting, what, what are the, the properties of the Z that you obtain, the optimal policy, the Z star, and in particular, you have things which are that Z should be compatible to Z star, satisfy some precautionary principles. So there are some very nice uh, properties. Uh, obviously, further works to be done, uh, especially on sensitivity to the pool of model and so on. And the last thing I wanted to mention is, okay, um, I discussed with Stefan earlier before the seminar and we were comparing our experience as head of respective departments and the impact it has on your brain and um, how it sucks uh, part of your research brain away. So the, um, I'm still inhabited by a, a research question <laughs> and uh, which has been with me now for many, many years. And this research question is really trying to understand but at a deep level, what underlines and determines the decision process under model uncertainty? So how does it work? Because I still don't know. So how, how can I understand what happens when you have a model? How does it work? So I, what I've been doing recently, and this is really recently, is trying to go back to the very basic concepts themselves. And the ba very basic concepts are, what is a model? Okay, uh, how do you take a decision? I mean, what do you need to take a decision? What is model uncertainty? But not only with my view that it comes from my background and my education and my expertise in a way, but in general. And so what I've been doing, I've been going around um, and I've been very privileged to meet very interesting people in a lot of different fields, and I've been interviewing them, asking them the same set of questions. And so I've been interviewing people from chemistry, drug design, economics, monetary policy, physics, astrophysics, anything. And I've been asking them, so what is a model in your field? What is an assumption? How important a notation is? Um, what is the impact of computer? Has it changed the way you take decision? What is model risk for you? What is model uncertainty? All the same questions. To try to figure out whether there was something in common in all these different fields. Whether being more, uh, you know, whether when you do astrophysics, somehow if, uh, I also went to speak to a medical clinician. So, you know, how do you take a decision about giving this particular drug to a patient or not? So is there anything in common? And um, I cannot tell you yet. <laughs> it has been a very interesting journey. So I've collected about 20 something different interviews. And um, I'm working now on bringing all of these perspectives into a single thing. But uh, yes, yeah, so I'm still uh, on the Crail quest, but still haven't solved it. And um, thank you for your attention and for your invitation. Thank you.
that's a good question. Obviously, um, the sensitivity to each time you introduce something, there is a question of how sensitive it is to this particular choice. Usually, uh, a typical answer will say, oh, you let the regulatory authority uh, set the threshold and then you work around this. Um, in this, it really depends on, on your particular application area. But obviously, uh, some, some works need to be done on finding you know, the robustness and the sensitivity around the threshold. Just the same as finding the sensitivity of the particular choice of the reference model is the same for the threshold. Can you yeah, sure. Okay, so in this particular um, paper that I presented, the idea is uh, if you look at parameter, parametric family, um, you don't look into the risk of this of estimating these parameters. Okay, but obviously that's something I mentioned later. What is really important is now to bring them back and bring the question of the estimation risk into the into the global picture. Okay. So um, we haven't done a sort of deep, deep, deep research on this, okay? So what I can say is that when you work with value at risk, things are doable for a certain class of models. If you work with expected shortfall, things become very complicated. So I don't know whether it exists for expected shortfall. You want water? <laughs> it seems to me that your, the definition that you propose here of the measurement of model risk is exposed in the sense that I will explain in a little bit, versus what decision theory sees the model uncertainty if you want ambiguity as an ex ante property of your preferences rather than uh, your decision based on these preferences. So, to make it clear, um, if you map your problem of minimizing a risk measure or you know, the, the first part of your talk, which was on risk measures, if you map it to a problem of maximizing preferences, sort of in a decision theoretic framework, ambiguity is a property of your preferences. And in your case, it would be, you know, it would be manifested in a collection of priors. And the idea is how do you make a decision based on this prior? So in your case, you have different models, which I'm calling priors. So I have a multi multitude of priors, and as you mentioned, there are two approaches, either you average them which is basically the smooth ambiguity model of the God of Marinacci and Kirji, or you take sort of a worst case scenario, which would be the Gilboa Schmeider approach. In the Gilboa Schmeider approach, or in the other approach as well, ambiguity is measured as a property, or at least I would imagine it would be measured as a property of your set of priors, rather than um, a sort of a diversions from one particular prior that you choose and you compare that to a worst case or I totally agree with you. The thing is, in the first part of the talk, we are looking at um, capital requirements imposed by a regulatory body. So the fact that you choose a particular model can be done in a certain way. But what the regulator is interested in is how much do you deviate from the worst case. They want to load you on that. So the purpose, somehow the decision of um, the, the computation the, is not the one of the decision maker in terms of the model. It's the one of the regulator who just want to make sure that the model you choose among all class of possible models is properly charged for the risk it represents. So it's just the purpose is different. Um, 
but I, I completely agree. If you were looking at your decision uh, as a financial institution to work and compute your prices and everything with a particular model, this would be exactly the framework that relates to your tolerance or your uh, preference level. But this is not the purpose. The purpose is the regulator coming and saying, I want to make sure that we load you the way it should, given the model you, ha you choose in this particular class. But, but in this case, two problems first is, what if the collection of priors or models that the regulator has doesn't intersect with yours? No, but that's the, the in, when you say, I can use internal models, you need to justify why. So this is in the approval setting. I could unite, the second part is, could you not basically make it, uh, or choose an average of models and that would be your sort of model choice, rather than picking one particular one? Uh, it could be. And then the question I ha uh, that is an interesting question always for me, it is, it's a more general question, not related to what I presented. But it's like, okay, let's say you have to compute a value at risk of something. You have different experts in the room. Will you ask them to compute directly their own value at risk? Or will you ask them to what is their distribution and then you do something and you compute an aggregate? So at which point do you do the aggregation, right? And so this is related to what do you ask your experts? because it makes a difference. I have no clue. <laughs> but it would make sense. 